begin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a really good guest and we have a great subject and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Here at the forum, we've recently been diving into the questions of free speech and academic freedom on campus. And we've done this in a couple of different ways. Uh, we hosted um, Hank Reichman, who is with the American Association of University Presidents, and he does a lot of work there for protecting academic freedom. And a couple of weeks ago, we hosted two professors who'd written a pretty interesting book, trying to think of some limits for academic freedom for faculty. Now I wanna bring up the uh, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Uh, this is a group that fights very hard for freedom of speech. They've been doing this for quite some time. And in fact, until recently, they were called the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Uh, they publish a lot of reports. They do a lot of legal advocacy work. And recently, they've been publishing reports on what they see as the climate of free speech on campus. So rather than telling you what they do, let me bring up Sean Stevens. He's a senior research fellow there, uh, not too far from me geographically here on the East Coast. Uh, he's the author of some of this research, and I'm, I'm going to, without any further ado, I'm going to bring him up on stage so we can start talking with him. There we go. Hello, Sean Stevens. Hi, how are you? All right. Good to see you. Um, and where are you today, I should ask? I'm in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. That's right. Well, um, here we have the East Coast fully represented, at least uh, the middle and the northeast. Um, <laughs> So we have a tradition on the forum where we ask people to introduce themselves by talking about what they're going to be doing next. I'm curious, in the next year, what are the big projects and the big ideas that are top of mind for you? Yeah, so as you mentioned, we've recently kind of started doing these reports on, on college students and the climate on campus for free speech. So we are planning to once again run that survey. Mm. We're going to up the number of schools to uh, 250, mm. 208 uh, the previous year. And so we're going to up that to about 250. Probably there's usually a handful. Then there's usually a handful more because there's usually alumni uh, at some schools who are just interested in having them surveyed. And so we kind of add them uh, after we've like already made the selection. So that's why we always wind up with kind of a weird number. So that's mm -hmm. one thing. Um, we're, we also recently completed a faculty survey, a nationwide faculty survey, uh, which asked about free speech and, and academic freedom. Um, some of the questions came from our student survey, so we can actually make some cross comparisons there with what faculty think versus what the students think. Um, mm -hmm. Others were completely new questions uh, geared more towards what faculty would, would experience, um, potentially encounter on campus. Um, we, so we did that and we, we were going to have next week, we're actually going to have a new research fellow starting whose expertise is in surveying faculty and, and studying faculty attitudes. So we're kind of... Oh, kind of wow. Yeah, launching more of a research project into kind of capturing what faculty think about these issues now. We think we have the students down fairly well um, with, with the ranking survey and a few other things, but uh, that's only part of the picture of, of trying to capture what a climate is like on a campus. And, and I, I would actually argue it's probably maybe more, more important to get the faculty attitude as important, if not more. Um, they're likely there for longer. Um, students mm -hmm. are there for four or five years leave campus, go elsewhere, faculty can be on, on a campus for decades. Uh, well, so we have those two major projects. And then there's a number of, like, as, as fire has been expanding, we have a number of other, uh, other things going on, but I'll, I'll, let's get, let's get to the more uh, <laughs> pressing matters at hand, I guess. Those are the well, two that major sounds great. I mean, it does sound like you'll be busy and I'm, I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next releases. Uh, friends, if you're if you're new to the forum, I'm going to ask our, our our guests a couple of questions just to get things rolling. But the forum's purpose is for you to ask your questions. Uh, so again, go back to that white bar in the bottom of the screen, and if you are if you want to ask a video question, just right, click the raised hand button. And if you've got a text question, press the Q and A box and type it in. Um, I'll remind you about that, but I think you'll find quite a lot to think about. My my first question is, Sean. Um, how how far back have you all been doing this? How many how many years have you been doing the survey of students? The survey we did the first survey in 2020. So we've done it in 2020, 2021, and then now in 2022. Each year it's gotten larger. Um, the first year was okay. about 20,000 students, and then we hit about 45,000 um, this most recent year. Is is there three years? I mean, is is that enough for a longitudinal analysis yet? You know, I I, I would say no. Um, I, for, there's for a few reasons, like number one, it's, it's, yes, it's only three years. I mean, I think that we want to continue to do this. So it grows into something more like the general social survey, 
the American yeah. election yeah. study, which are asked repeatedly, and they build up a data set over decades. And there, I think you can really start looking more at, at trends over time. Mm -hmm. um, but another reason why is we've, you know, we've changed some of the questions each year uh, to try and better, you know, get a better measure. But, you know, it's the, fir the first year we did it, we're trying questions out, and then we want to tweak them, improve them, make them better um, as we've collected data on them. So some questions have been asked every year, but others haven't. Some have been slightly tweaked. I think you can probably still make those comparisons as long as you know that they were slightly tweaked. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it's long enough to really capture like any long-term trends yet. It's just a nice repository of data right now. Got it. Got it. I uh, appreciate that. And within that repository, I mean, what are some of the, what are some of the uh, top line findings in your, in your take? I mean, my, my sense is that we get some students who say that they believe in free speech and some students who say they think it should be limited for certain reasons. That seems, it seems kind of contradictory in some ways. I mean, but, but you're, you're the expert here. What's, what's your sense? Yeah. So I, you just described, I think something that's a very, I would call it like almost like a classic finding or an expected finding in most mm -hmm. of the literature polling data and like peer reviewed scholarship on support for civil liberties, support for free speech, or how it's kind of proxy measured a lot of times in the political science realm and in the general social survey as tolerance for a controversial speaker or, or, or an individual. And you, you generally see that when asked in the abstract about issues like free speech, free expression, academic freedom, people are supportive of it almost overwhelmingly supportive in, in certain cases, like you'll hit like numbers like 90, 95%. Wow. But that evaporates when you then add specifics and ask about more detailed cases and you say exactly what the person is expressing or what they're saying, then you are always going to find like, you know, notable portions of people to even majorities that are opposed um, to these types of targets. So I think that, you know, we kind of have that we don't necessarily have that pattern in our data because we don't actually, knowing that that was the case, we didn't really ask an abstract question about, do you just support this stuff in general? Um, but so, so our top line findings, I would say, is what we do find is students are, they're certainly, there's a notable like majority to probably about 50% to about two thirds who say there's some level of discomfort expressing views um, when they disagree with a professor, whether that's in the classroom or in writing. Um, when we ask follow-ups as to why students self-censor, we see the number of students uh, answer that they're afraid of for their grade. Um, mm -hmm. This is an interesting finding because while it's challenging to study, the people who have attempted to study this and capture if this is actually a thing have found essentially no evidence that like, a student's politics impacts how the professor grades them. Right, the professor's not looking to get them for their politics, but I think it's still a concern if students think that they are. Like whether or not whether or not it's actually happening, that it's a concern, I think is it's it's something to, that we should note and, and try to address. Um, yeah. other, other things that come up are there's definitely just like social media is seen as a place where they're not comfortable expressing controversial views. There could be pylons, things mm. like that. It could damage their reputation. Um, mm. Students, predictably, um, based on ideology, liberal students are, you know, pretty intolerant of pretty controversial conservative speakers, but the same is also true of conservative students um, for controversial liberal speakers. Um, you know, notable portions find, they say, and, you know, I, it's very careful, you got to, like, think about how the question's worded, so I don't think that students aren't going to rush out there and you know physically block entry to events in mass numbers or you can get violent but if they're asked if the behaviors are acceptable to disrupt the campus event pretty notable portions say shout downs are acceptable to some degree um about a little under 40 percent say blocking entry to an event and the way we've the way the data looks like it seems like that's being interpreted as physically blocking entry, like not a, not like, a, not like some kind of line where there's not going to be physical interaction, because um, it, it mm -hmm. always is seen as less acceptable than shouting down um, a speaker. So mm -hmm. we can kind of read that as they're probably taking that as physically blocking entry. And then about one in five, do you say the use of violence could be acceptable? You know, uh, most of them say rarely, but they're saying it's acceptable in some circumstances. So what was that? 
What was that number? Was it one in five? One in five, oh. say. And and you know, I'm very, I was very like note. It's like one percent say the word always acceptable, and something like four or five percent say sometimes. So, and most of the rest of that twenty percent is saying rarely. So it's in very rare circumstances. Mm -hmm. But rarely is different from never. So we would say that they're finding that acceptable to some degree. Um, and then we found the last two years when we ask it in a frequency based way that about one in five students say they self censor often, like very or fairly often, um, because they're, you know, afraid of how um, student, other students, faculty or administrators will react or respond to what they say. Oh, so it's not just their grade, but it's it's the whole academic community. Yeah, uh, the broad finding I, I think I would say is is what we found is, is in this year we added questions that kind of got more at are you worried about your reputation being damaged, things like that. Um, the broad finding is yeah, there it's just people are worried about social consequences mm. if they say mm. controversial things that then. You know, if they if they weigh in on a political matter or what's obviously a controversial topic, and they quote say the wrong thing, they're worried about the negative social consequences that can happen. Got it. Um, well, thank you. That's a terrific set of top line findings. I've, I've been tweeting this out, um, and uh, Lisa Durf has been uh, following along, and there's been some commentary in the chat. And in fact, we we have uh, we have some questions already, and I was I was going to follow up with one. Let, let me let me just ask you one more, just just to just to poke things a little little further. What um, once you publish this research, what surprised you in the reactions to it that has occurred? Well, so honestly, I mean, we kind of always expect there to be like some people, like we expect there to be some people who like love it and they kind of maybe knee jerk uh, send it around or tweet it out or talk about it without necessarily like really diving into it and, and seeing what it says. Um, and then on the flip side, there's like the typical kind of criticisms that may fall in that category as well. It's reading of the executive summary or top line findings and, and not necessarily a full dive into the report. Um, mm -hmm. And there's like criticisms about methodology or questions about who was in the sample, things like that. And mm -hmm. so what was surprising, I think this year was kind of, that latter didn't happen as like didn't really happen. Um, the critiques that we found were actually very thoughtful, like methodological and engaging critiques, and, and we had um, pretty good back and forths with the authors of those critiques. Um, so like I thought that was like really that was cool actually and somewhat surprising. Um, yeah, I mean other than that, I mean like the results. I, I don't think anything was necessarily that surprising in the results this year um, per se. Um, you know, they, they're honestly not terribly different from last year's. And I don't think that's that surprising. I don't think things are going to change it, like, you know, in the snap of a finger or things like that. Um, what was encouraging from like a validity standpoint, I think, was by expanding the number of schools and including a lot more. Um, there's, there's interesting little nuances when you dive in and look at individual schools and how they score on the items um, compared to nationally. And you can kind of, you know, there's, for one example, we surveyed the all five of the Claremont colleges this year. Uh, last year we went to Claremont kind of this year we added the other four. And mm -hmm. I was going through the data and, and we were writing up kind of a smaller summary of those five. I noticed that at like Pomona College, something like three quarters of the students said the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was this very difficult topic to have an open, honest conversation about. And so it's like, okay, so what happened on this campus when it's not happening on like all these other ones? Mm -hmm. Sure enough, there's been a recent controversy over the Israel-Palestine -Pal Israel relations on Pomona campus, on Pomona College's campus. Um, so like little things like that I thought were interesting and surprising, but it's like to me encouraging like from a validity standpoint of, of the survey itself. Well, that's a tricky thing. I mean, uh, American higher education is incredibly uh, decentralized in many ways, um, and local conditions are, are so powerful. Um, at, at this point, Sean, just, just to let you know, I, I usually pause and say, you know, please submit questions. There are 10 questions already, okay. and I haven't even said anything. So. <laughs> But uh, and these these come from uh, all over the place. So I'll, I'll start flashing on the screen again, friends. If you want to join us on stage, um, you can see that uh, 
it's we're, we're all pretty friendly. Uh, this is a, a question from Annie Epperson. Is FIRE more concerned with issues of free speech in the classroom or on campus, like non-curricular discourse? I'm thinking of free speech zones at a student center or protesting controversial speakers. I'd say equally concerned about both. Uh, the, the policies, you know, the administrative policies that set up things like free speech zones are certainly things FIRE is known to you know, kind of frown upon and urge schools to change and in, in some ways kind of challenge um, especially if they're unconstitutional, they will file legal briefs, et cetera. But there's also a whole arm of fire where we defend faculty and students like pro bono because they've gotten in trouble for things they've said in the classroom or in, you know, on ca on campus space, professors mm -hmm. in, the, in case where they're getting um, in trouble or, or maybe targeted for research that they've done or research that they've published. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say it's actually fair. It's an equal concern on, on both. Um, and, you know, as, as mentioned at the outset, that was the, the college campus was FIRE's primary concern for the first uh, 23, 24 years of its existence. Um, mm -hmm. We only recently expanded to kind of now uh, care about off-campus issues. Well, thank you. Uh, Annie, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, and actually, Annie followed up with another uh, clarifying question. Let me just mm -hmm. quickly pop this up. Um, does uh, FIRE differentiate between public and private institutions? And are, if so, are findings different from one to the other? Yeah, we do. We, we, we differentiate between public and private, and we even do private, like we differentiate between secular and, and religious institutions in, in those cases. Uh, in terms of like our college survey data, um, broad finding I could say is one thing we see is like the larger public state schools um, typically tend to do better or have better results. I mean, there's clear exceptions. I mean, the U, U Chicago has always been one of our top ranked schools. Uh, each year we've done it. Claremont mm -hmm. has been in the in the top 10 um, both years we've surveyed them. So it's not mm -hmm. like a hard and fast thing, but we have noticed this pattern where schools with like a larger student body, which particularly are your more public state universities, um, students, in terms of the scores and the rankings, they, they do better. Like one hypothesis I have on this is at a smaller liberal arts college or a smaller elite college where there's maybe only a few thousand students in the student body uh, mm -hmm. compared to 10, 15, 20, 30, in some cases over 40,000. Um, this has the, the feel of like a small village almost where almost everybody knows everybody. Um, right. And so if, if you kind of run afoul and, and, and become a, like the, the pariah for something you, you've said, um, it probably has a lot more consequences in terms of that smaller setting than it does in a larger setting. Um, in a larger student body, chances are you can probably find other like-minded individuals who, who share your views and, and you can feel comfortable expressing them with, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that's one of the broad findings we see. Um, I, I'll be honest, haven't do, do, like done much in terms of looking at religions versus non-religious institutions. We have a handful in there. Um, so those comparisons could be done, um, but I haven't looked at that really yet. So I couldn't comment on any differences there. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, Annie, that's a, another really good question. Uh, and friends, if you're new to the forum, those are two great examples of a Q&A box question. Uh, I, I do want to, uh, another Q&A box question. This is uh, from our good friend, uh, Glenn McGee. He actually has two, and these are both mm -hmm. uh, kind of material research questions. Um, and, uh, and these may be technical, you might want to take these offline, I don't know. Um, but one is he um, has a public records question. I filed a public records question in Florida, lost the local circuit, lost in the appellate court, but later found a case that won. How do you reconcile these? Well, fortunately, since I'm not an attorney, I'm not actually, I don't know if I could give you the best answer there. Um, I'm happy to put you in touch with people at FIRE that could, that could give you a thoughtful answer on that. Okay, very good, very good. And then Glenn had another, uh, uh, again, detailed question. How can we access the survey form? Oh, yeah. So you could go to rankings at the fire.org. That brings you to, that should bring you to the landing page. Let me just make sure that that's it. Yeah, that'll bring you to the landings page, like a landing page where you can see the rankings and download the report. Um, another way you could access it is if you go to the fire.org um, at the bottom of the home page, kind of on the bottom left hand side. Uh, you can click that that gives you a more like a landing page where you can it, it lets you view the rankings you can view the report online 
Um, there's a direct link to exploring the data, which there's a dashboard set up online. Um, and then you can download the press release, which is the executive summary. The report had in the appendix, the report has all the survey questions with the top line results. I'm also happy to share the raw data file with anybody that wants it. They can just send an email request to data at the fire.org. Uh, oh, the CSV file and uh, the code book so you can analyze the data yourself. Well, that's very kind. Um, Glenn, thank you for those questions. Uh, Glenn's a hardcore data and sociology guy, so I'm sure he'll be happy to see these. Uh, we have more questions piling up. Uh, I, I have to stop asking you guys to ask questions because it's <laughs> we've done it at this point. This is from uh, 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 William Colucci. Is most of the student pushback against free speech not just in the elite schools? So I think the, the problem, you know, this the, the pushback problem that you see is probably more acute in the elite schools. Um, but controversies over speech aren't like they, they happen on campuses, like all across the country, I think, regardless of their status. But I would say, yeah, the problem is probably more acute at the at, at more of the elite institutions. Um, some of the schools that were in the like more in the like near the bottom of our rankings um, this year, we started incorporating um, we, we maintain these two databases as well. So campus disinvitation attempts and scholars under fire. And, and so the latter, the, the former, I think is pretty self-explanatory what it is. It's like a speaker gets invited to campus and, and there's a campaign to disinvite them. And so we kind of log if they're successful or not, if the event was disrupted. So we have kind of that data. And then we have scholars under fire, which is a, tries to log attempts to sanction. It's not just professors, that's why we call it scholars. It's basically anyone who's kind of participating as an academic um, so this could be PhD students who are doing, you know, they're doing peer review research and they're, they're teaching courses. Um, mm -hmm. It could be, it's mostly going to be professors and faculty, uh, but it could also be people like postdocs, um, research fellows who are, who are at like a university center. Um, mm -hmm. But the key thing is you're affiliated with a university and you're kind of contributing to the academic discussion uh, in some way. And so we attempt to track attempts to get them investigated, suspended, terminated, et cetera. So we factored this data into the rankings this year. And some of the schools in the in the bottom 10, um, they're fairly elite. Uh, and they're the schools that have kind of the most attempts to sanction scholars at them. Um, so I think that's one example of it being maybe more acute at some of these more elite schools. Interesting, interesting. Oh, great question. Um, and, uh, and thank you for that great answer, Sean. Uh, we have uh, another one comes up from um, Michael Meeks at uh, Louisiana State, uh, and Michael asks, are you picking up a reason we have this cancel culture? Shout downs are acceptable. Do you pick up why? Their reasoning. Mm -hmm. well, their reasoning. Um, yeah, so I mean, I have I have ideas on maybe why. So we, but I have my, I have my own ideas on maybe why, you know, that, that kind of brings in other stuff. But we, we do ask, like I said, we ask an open-ended question. Um, after our self-censorship question. So if they say they never feel uncomfortable sharing their views because they don't feel these consequences from you know, a lot of people, like I mentioned before, they don't get the follow-up. But anybody who says anything besides never, we say, can you tell us about a time that this happened? Um, there's a lot in there, but so I think the re so a lot of the reasoning um, for why students um push back on on certain forms of expression certain things that are being said there there is this shift there's, there's been i think kind of a normative shift and and you see this in some political science data as well um mm. where previously like for decades people with college experience with a college education compared to those who didn't didn't have that experience and don't have a college degree there, there's like this tolerance gap and there's the the college educated that group is always was always more tolerant even of the really like loathsome speakers who were like you know mm -hmm. talking about biological uh, like genetic determinations of like racial intelligence like speakers like that right mm -hmm. um, so that gap has vanished in the last decade and it's primarily because the more the college educated group has become less tolerant of those more loathsome speakers. Um, and so there's this idea that there's kind of this normative shift where free speech, free expression, this idea, it used to not be contested as a norm. It was considered like this value. And like we talked about earlier, when asked about in the abstract, almost everybody says they value it, they believe in it, they think it's really important. But 
the idea in the political science literature. And I think what we see in some of the comments from students and they're talking about why it's like things have changed, things like this. It's I think there's been this shift where it's not a it's not like this cherished, like uncontested norm anymore. It's actually contested. Mm. Um, and then mm. the value of it is is it's it's being seen as in conflict with other important values that that students have. Mm. Mm. Um, well, thank you for that very thoughtful answer. Um, and uh, Mike, thank you for that uh, good question probing at this. Um, we have uh, a quick question from Lisa Durf, which I can I can read to you. I, I can't share uh, clearly, but um, he just asked, she asks, is this a generational thing? Uh, and I think you just started answering that, saying that there's a there's a, a shift, at least in general attitudes. But are you seeing this breaking down by age, broken down by age? Yeah. So I mean, it. I it, my my inkling is I think it might it might actually be more of like a generational like cohort thing, and it's not a college student non. It's not college, non-college. It's more, I think it might actually be more of a generational cohort. We have, we don't have as much data on mm -hmm. the general public and, and people that aren't, you know, aren't enrolled in college, but we have a few data sets where we surveyed the general public. Um, I have a data set from about two years ago where I in particular requested a sample of college students and a sample of equivalent age, you know, 18 to 24 year olds who are not enrolled in college and ask them as similar questions as we could. I mean, obviously you can't ask non-college students about how they feel in the classroom <laughs> about certain things, um, but, uh, but, you know, so tried to make it as parallel as possible. And, you know, what I see in, in those data sets is it's, there's not much difference. It's, it's the young, like younger, like 18 to 24, 18 to 29 tend to be less supportive of speech and expression than, than older counterparts. So there is there is some, yeah, a bit of a generational skew. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Thank you for the question. Um, we have uh, uh, a couple of people who have circled back to ask more questions. Uh, Annie Epperson um, asks a uh, partnership question. Um, mm -hmm. Would Fire routinely partner with the American Association of University um, Professors to help protect and defend faculty voice, or perhaps even with the American Civil Liberties Union? Yeah, I mean we've partnered with both organizations in the past um on cases on briefs um on other like not not on we haven't partnered with them on any of the survey research that we do or things like that but we have partnered with them in the past on legal cases and briefs yes okay thanks good question uh and then again this comes back to my my clumsy attempt at a longitudinal question for you uh glenn asks a much better question uh which is uh what's been the impact of covid <laughs> So that's actually pretty interesting. I'd say so the in year two, uh, the 2021 data set, which we collected kind of at the peak when there were a lot of students not even on campus. Uh, we 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 asked we asked questions right at the outset, like basically, are you even on campus and in the classroom? Um, and so that year, I think, was very interesting in that we found that a lot of students were remote. Um, they still commented on there being these issues. So some students, if they were in their first year, mm -hmm. when they were asked about, you know, to elaborate on an open-ended thing about their experience on campus, a good number of them noted that they haven't even been on campus yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they still have concerns about doing it even in these remote settings or whatever, or they've heard things, blah, blah, blah. Um, the students that have been on campus, uh, an interesting thing we, we found was we, we did ask, um, you know, if you've pre if you have been on campus before and you're now taking kind of like remote classes, how do you feel about them? And it was like an equal, it was it was roughly equal percentages said that it's about the same. I can express my views, nothing's really changed. But then what was equal with that was no, it's actually kind of more intimidating and worse. And you know, very few said it's easier, essentially. Um, so I think one trend there is with the online. With, with being more online, I think that could, for some students, make it more difficult. You know, this is more speculation now because we didn't ask follow-ups on this question, but reasons for that could be the sessions are being recorded. Um, you know, they, they're on the screen and everybody can see you and you can see everybody and, and things like that. Um, so yeah. I, that's speculative, but I, I think there was, there was definitely something interesting going on that year, um, for sure. But the, in terms of the data itself, 
like the questions that we've asked repeated <laughs> year, they didn't, the top lines didn't really move around that much on those questions. That's interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, so we may have something stable that appears from this. Um, we have a, a question that came from uh, on Twitter from our good friend, uh, Robin DeRosa. Wasn't able to make it, but she wanted me to ask the question. So let me just read this. It's three tweets. And I think there's a couple of questions here. Uh, how does the FIRE campaign relate? Uh, oh, excuse me. Excuse me, I skipped one. Uh, so uh, FIRE has raised millions of dollars for a three-year litigation, opinion research, and public education campaign aimed at boosting and solidifying support for free speech values. How does the FIRE campaign relate to the extreme right wing's recent targeting of teachers and curriculum that is, ironically, branded as a free speech campaign? And who were the major funders of this FIRE campaign? And what relationship do they have to the funding of recent legislative campaigns like divisive concepts and don't say gay scriptures? Uh, so first off, um, I mean, we've actually sued um, the state of Florida over the don't say gay bill. Mm. and things like that um so uh, we've we've filed legal briefs against these kind of, of bills going on um across the country so our stance on that is we're obviously against them uh we think they're a threat to to teachers academic freedom um in the classroom uh we were, we were involved in you know another example is we were you know have fairly involved in um last year at boise state um there was there was like the state of idaho had passed a bill that potentially was going to uh, limit um, a number of courses that could be offered at the college level, um, Boise State, in terms of like um, diversity courses, things like that. Um, so we were involved in that. Uh, so we were, you know, we we our stance on those bills is they're they're unconstitutional and they threaten faculty and, and teachers' academic freedom, and we would challenge we would challenge them or, or file briefs against them. Um, in terms of the campaign to expand it, we have we do have foundation donors, but most of our donors are small donors and individuals. It's a lot of alumni from these various colleges. Um, that I mean, that some of the many of them that, that we've surveyed. Um, the you know we 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 have some money from the Stanton Foundation um, as part of the expansion. We have some money from from the Koch Family Foundation as part of the expansion. We have funders from the left and the right. Um, yeah. Okay, so most of the funders are small, yeah, um, and um, and then you do have some from the left and the right. Yeah, okay. We have we have, fu we have fu funding from across the ideological spectrum. We have a few foundation sized donors that are you know they give larger than the individuals obviously can, but the majority of donors are individuals, and I'd say mostly alumni of these colleges of the of colleges across the country. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's you know it. In the last uh, six months, not even six months, it's like, I guess it's the last like four or five months that's obviously expanded because of well, us announcing the expansion and making kind of a PR push. So there's probably, mm -hmm. that's probably diversified and it's not only, you know, primarily alumni from colleges now, but um, I, I'd say a good chunk of them are, are just alumni from these institutions. Interesting, interesting. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Robin, for that great question. Uh, always look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we've got a question from our, our dear friend and, uh, and frequent guest, uh, Tom Hames, uh, who asks a typically provocative and deep question. Uh, are you saying that colleges should be required to give anyone a podium who wants it? No, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, but I think, you know, what we, you know, what we argue is, you know, a student group invites a speaker to campus, right? And they're, their constitutional rights allow them to do so. You know, our approach is we don't want the school stepping in and canceling that event. Um, we'd certainly oppose a heckler's veto type scenario where a protest of it turns into a shout down and maybe even like an event disruption where in these are certainly rare, but they do happen where, you know, students are pulling fire alarms to kind of disrupt the event and, and basically drown out the speaker's ability to talk. And then, the, you know, there's been a few instances where that's even spilled over into, into violence. Um, so the, the heckler's veto itself is not, it's not constitutional because you're limiting other people's ability to hear the speech. So those are the types of things we oppose. So in, in those situations where a loathsome, deplorable speaker 
has been invited to campus, um, we'd encourage, uh, actually, there's a good example, I think, of what happened. There's like a good contrast of it. Um, University of Wisconsin this week, Matt Walsh was there, um, mm -hmm. and they encouraged a, basically, there was like a counter protest, counter event at the time, you know, like basically to run at the same time, and there's, and there's like a counter protest, and there wasn't a shout down, there wasn't like a disruption of the speaking event itself. We'd, we'd far prefer something like that than, I mean, at Penn State, I mean, it's not clear to me that probably was the right call. It seems like the crowd was getting, there was violence um, developing in the crowd and, and there was like opposing like groups of, of protesters. But at Penn State this week, the cancellation of the Gavin McGinnis event is kind of the flip side or contrast of that. And so I think it's a, we, what we would encourage in those instances is hold a counter event. It might be better to have more people at your counter event than at the original event, right, than, than the speaker itself. And then you're also not giving a lot of these loathsome speakers. I would, say, I would say their goal actually is to get that rise and get that reaction. And so you're not giving them what they want. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Tom has a gift for the for the deft question that that uh, goes right through, and I appreciate Sean your gift at having a very concise and thoughtful reply. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, we have more questions coming, and I I I, I should just say please uh, submit questions. And again, if you want to join us on stage too, uh, just hit the video button. We'd we'll be glad to see you. Um, and this is a, a kind of follow up on the on the COVID question. Mm -hmm. um, can, since the instruction moved online, how have things mm -hmm. changed? Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah. So what's interesting is it moved online really heavily for the, the one year, it seems like. And oh. in this year's data, we kept in this the one of the questions where it was basically like, are your classes mostly online, mostly in person, all in per, et cetera. And this year, the data shows that it's largely shifted back to mostly in person. Um, there are a handful of schools, I don't remember them offhand right now, but if you know, if you go through and poke around in the data, there's there's a handful of schools where they, they remained, I think, more online. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of schools, it seems like, have largely returned to mostly being in person. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, what, what changes are likely gonna be permanent is like, well, I think they're just gonna be there's going to be more of an option to take remote courses if students want them. Mm -hmm. um, I think for some students, that's great. Some people learn well in that setting and for other students that might not work so well. Um, you know, I'm just thinking like I used to, I used to be when I was getting my PhD and, and when I was a postdoc, I taught plenty at Rutgers. So it's like, I'm just thinking of for some students, I think that'd be really great. And for other students, I think they'd struggle with it. Just like, I think some, like almost any human, it's like some of us do well with these Zoom meetings and some of us are like, I can't really do this every day, all day, and I need I need a break from this. And it's kind of, it's, it's very cognitively demanding. Um, so you know, I don't, outside of that, I don't know if I can say much else because I don't think there's much in our data that says, that, that gets more at like what's going on for them in the classroom, like in terms of their educational experience. Like we really stick to like asking about expression in the questions. Very good. Very good. And one thing, just to make it worse, is that we have uh, uh, various terms for this, but where you blend face-to-face -face and online instruction. Uh, so, you know, some people are online, some mm -hmm. people are face-to-face. -face. Uh, some would call this hybrid, some of us would call it yeah. high flex, there are other terms. But um, but it's interesting to think about just in terms of how the uh, online environment is different in, uh, in terms of speech. But let me just get out of the way because we have more questions. John Hollenbeck mm -hmm. uh, coming to us actually from, uh, I believe, from the Wisconsin area. Um, says, asks you a, a big question. What would the ideal heaven of free speech on campus look like? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so I, I guess it, it would be this place where ideas can be contested, including, you know, ones that come from different political perspectives. Um, and it doesn't there isn't like this air of, of almost uh, like a persecutory persecuting society 
Um, students don't, I, I don't think every, like, I certainly don't think everybody has to agree. I think that'd be kind of boring. <laughs> so I want people to be able to have these disagreements. I think like a campus is one reason fire was so focused on campuses for so long and why we still continue to care so much about it is it's, it's like the ideal environment for modeling this behavior and taking young adults and showing them how to do this so that they then take this when they leave college out into out into the world like you're creating almost this space where we we, we do have these more harder complicated discussions we learn to have them we learn to be respectful quite i know i'm using like a lot of buzzwords that that sound great and it's like i have no idea how to actually make all that happen but it looks like a place where different views can be discussed openly People can disagree, mm -hmm. sometimes even very strongly, but it doesn't evolve into a, like a, like a need to get the other person like for what they think or what they said. Well, that's pretty clear. Uh, that's a pretty concise and clear answer to uh, John's great question. Uh, thank you. Uh, the the chat box, by the way, has just been going like gangbusters. <laughs> And I, I, I want to pull out one theme that came from that, um, which was, I'm going to paraphrase this because I'm, I'm, it happened a couple of times. Um, the question of hate speech. Um, so if I get this right, people in the chat, please correct me if I got this wrong. Um, the idea that somebody can support free speech, they can say they're supporting free speech as a, a cover for them saying hate speech. Um, and those in the chat, if you want to just jump on that and, and flesh that out, give it actually some verbs. Um, um, and if, if Sean, is that is that something you want to you want to wrangle with? Yeah, we can we can go we can discuss. Um, let's say I, I don't think anyone has uh, uh, followed this up yet, um, but I think I think this is I, I guess this is one of the interesting problems is uh, on campus is the question of hate speech. I mean, hate mm -hmm. speech. As far as I can tell, legally, doesn't have much of a standard. The Supreme Court has shut this down a couple of times. Um, but we still, you know, the idea is a popular one. Uh, just speaking in the U.S., I mean, other nations actually do have speech national laws. Um, I mean, is, 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 this, uh, is this kind of the, the, the bedrock tension here um, on campus where people actually want to say something which is going to be clearly defined as free speech or uh, as hate speech and, and they use free speech to cover it up? That's, I mean, that's certainly, you know, when I was, we were talking about invited speakers and, and heckler's veto, you know, I mentioned that there's, 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 there are loathsome speakers who you could put in like a deplorable box or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I think, like, I think an example of one of these is Milo, you know, his, mm -hmm. his this is going back a handful of years, but 2016, 2017, he's doing his tour on college campuses and the entire goal was to be a troll and get a rise out of people because he knew what he was saying is going to offend and he's mm -hmm. not really contributing much, um, if at all, uh, to the conversation, at least on campus. And, and yes, there's no legal definition in the United States of hate speech, but clearly his views would fall in that category when people say that's hate speech, like, most people probably would agree that that th those views fall in the bucket. Um, yeah, I mean, so he's he's a troll, and there's different ways of handling that. There's not giving the troll what he wants. Like that's my kind of preferred <laughs> preferred method. Um, versus, you know, kicking, telling the group that invited him, and that's that's like a different thing that gets put aside for a second. There's ways of doing things of how to handle maybe that because it's like if the student group invited him. So, you know, the faculty member sponsoring said group, um, there's actually at our conference, someone told a story about this happening. Um, I don't remember what's, I think it was at university. It might've been University of Delaware, I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, I think it was, Milo was invited to campus mm -hmm. um, and the, the faculty member who sponsored the group basically wrote an op-ed in the student newspaper where it said, yeah, you can invite him. But like, you really, should, you know, like you should be thinking about this and like, there's going to be consequences for inviting him. And basically the professor was like, 
if you go forward with the event, like I'm, I don't oppose you going forward with the event, but I'm no longer going to sponsor. I will no longer be the faculty sponsor of this group, right? Right. things like that. Um, so that's kind of modeling the behavior of it. Um, you know, at, at the other end, it's like, I think Milo wants you to move his speech off campus and he wants you to like, basically say, don't allow him so he can make a bigger and bigger deal out of it and, and create yeah. this kind of false impression of what a university is like. And then he makes money off it. I mean, he's lost all his money because he's, <laughs> there's other things going on with that guy, but you know, I, that I would prefer to handle it kind of that way because it, it doesn't give them what they want and doesn't allow them to kind of create this or amplify this like moral panic that, that there's an impression that those people want to create that impression. Um, but then also, you know, the history of restrictions on speech and expression and calls for it. And yeah, it, it's great to, it might, it, it might be great to basically say, Oh, this stuff is just clearly out of bounds and whatever, but the way our minds work is our concepts creep we kind of keep expanding them. And what we see a lot of times historically is when we pass things like this that restrict expression, they ultimately get turned on the groups whose expression we don't want to restrict. That's the problem. Uh, it becomes a policy, it becomes a tool and uh, people can use it in all directions. Um, Lisa et al, everyone who was, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, discussing this, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, uh, more questions. Um, and I, I, I want to bring in one. This bounces back, Sean, uh, a couple of weeks. We hosted uh, a, a couple of scholars, uh, 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 Michel de Roubaix and uh, also uh, Jennifer Ruth, who have a new book about uh, academic free speech. Uh, and they had a very, they had an interesting argument. I mean, one I haven't seen before. Uh, and it was basically that uh, uh, free speech, academics, so faculty free speech, I think they also applied to staff, but faculty free speech should be surveyed by other faculty, um, much like faculty publications should be surveyed in terms of peer review and, and you know, promotion, tenure, hiring review. Uh, let me just put this up on the screen. Glenn had a, a phrase of it. So he's wondering, what do you think of the definition of academic freedom as limited to faculty? You know, so, uh, you know, uh, Sean, you're teaching a class on stats and, uh, and you give a, you know, a bad definition of a problem, you know, another stats colleague should be able to assess that, right, and figure, you know, you're not good at teaching it. Uh, if I'm teaching a class on, on technology and then I start ranting about um, uh, uh, the protocols of the elders of Zion, then people could say, well, you're, you're, as a faculty member, you're out of bounds and you're saying something that's wrong. But then they wanted faculty to assess that. Uh, and formally, they wanted every campus to have a, I might get this wrong, uh, I must say a faculty free speech committee, something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, that's, that's a narrow slice of what you're talking about. You're, you're, you're talking about faculty and students alike, but, but what, what do you think about that? Is that something that would make sense for your perspective? Uh, so, I mean, I far prefer as someone who, I, like I said, I, I mean, I now I work at a nonprofit, but I worked at a university. Um, I was a grad student and then I worked at a university as like a postdoc researcher and a research fellow for a number of years. And so I, I know I know the setting and I've taught. Uh, I would far prefer faculty be the ones uh, in charge of reviewing other faculty uh, than administrators. Like that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I 100% I would think that. Um, the, you know, the, the idea of like some kind of committee that like, I, you know, on that, I don't know necessarily where I would fully stand. It, it almost becomes another than almost like an administrative committee, right? Like, so I'm not sure if I would go that far, but I, I certainly am far more comfortable with faculty being like the primary referees of other faculty than almost anybody else. <laughs> um, well, thank you, uh, Glenn. Thank you for reaching back, and, uh, and Sean, thank you. If, if you haven't had a chance to, to uh, check out the book, I, I really recommend it. It's beautifully written, and uh, I can send you our, our discussion because the both of them were just great interlocutors. Uh, now we're, we're coming close to the end of the hour. Somehow, uh, I feel like we just started, um, but I, I wanted to put in one of my questions, um, which is, uh, and, and Michael Meeks actually came up with this as well. If we take a look at your three years of, of analysis, three years of data, and, and we extrapolate it forward a bit, mm -hmm. uh, say the next five, the next 10 years, how, how do you think colleges and universities will be different? And again, I'm talking at the macro level, every college is different. 
Um, and as you expand your data set, it, it may adjust. But how, how does this you know, kind of synthesis, this concrete set of beliefs about free speech, how might that change higher education moving forward? Well, so one thing I'll say is that they'll draw on another data set first that because it's relevant yeah. for the future. Um, Excellent. The future of the First Amendment uh, done by the Freedom Forum, they do this survey every every so often, every couple of years of high school students. Um, mm. Just put out a data set from 2022. And just long story short, not to get bogged down in it because we're short on time, but the current high school students, um, basically their views and support and attitudes towards free speech for expression um, are lower than current college students. So they were comparing that to the data from the Knight Foundation um, and a, a recent college student survey they put out. Um, so I would say like knowing that there's a potential for some of these trends to continue and maybe some of these speech trends to continue and possibly intensify as these high school students replace existing college students. Um, but I also think like there's been this interest, there's this interesting thing where I think you're starting to see schools. I, I don't want to say, I don't want to dichotomize it and say like picking a side because I don't think it's actually like, that's not like, it's not an either or choice or conflict, but there are certain schools out there that are basically very clearly being like, no, we're going to go with like the free speech end. Um, and others that I think try to, they do a number of things, but it's, it's maybe not necessarily fully clear to everybody then where they stand on the issue. So it's like there's, there's, there's colleges and universities that are taking a very clear stance on being in favor of free speech and expression. And then there's a lot of others. So I think it's a bit more murky or we see this in our, in our data. We ask about perception. I didn't mention this in the beginning on the top lines, but we ask a few questions about their perceptions of the administration's stance. Like, is it clear that they support free speech and are they likely to defend someone during a controversy and at the schools like U Chicago, Claremont McKenna, Purdue, places that have had a very clear public embrace of free speech, academic freedom, expression, the students, it, it's clear that the students are aware of this. Mm -hmm. And then at other, at other universities and colleges, it's, it's a lot murkier. Um, so one thing I would say is a potential thing we could see is if more and more colleges kind of go that route and embrace it, like we should start to see that in the data in terms of administrative questions. Um, and then at those schools, like the other thing that's, that we tend to see are, and, and I want to note you Chicago and Claremont McKenna in particular on this, because they have student bodies that are still pretty heavily liberal in terms of how the students identify. Um, and when we look at the tolerance for the different kinds of speakers, they definitely still favor the liberal speakers by a decent amount. Like the gap between their averages are, is still like notable, but they're still like two of the top like 20 or 30 schools on tolerance for conservatives. So I think hmm. there, like, there's something going on at, at schools like that. Um, and I think as, if more and more schools adopted that kind of approach or model, we would potentially see that in the, in the data that we collect. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, thank you. That's uh, that's very nuanced. That's um, I, I would love to follow this up. And the problem is we're so we're right. Um, when we do when we do webinars and Q and A's, like I'm, I'm totally willing to always do this. If someone wants to just pull all the questions from the chat, like I'm willing to, like we have a blog, we can write up, like you know, call them. Kind of, I'm sure some of them are similar, so distill them into like. This is a, a question, but happy to write write up some answers to those um, as a follow up. Uh, well, that's great, uh, friends in the chat. Um, do you have uh, anyone have any objections? Let me know. I can, uh, of course, anonymize this uh, as a text file, um, and then uh, send that to Sean at Fire and uh, give him a chance. Uh, so let me know if you have any uh, if you have any objections to that. Um, and uh, Sean, while people are thinking about this, what's the best way to keep up with uh, uh, FIRE's research on this and your own work? So, you know, the fire.org is our, is our main site. Um, we have, have a Twitter as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually not a Twitter person, so you'll have to give me a second to find what that actually is. <laughs> um, but we have a Twitter feed too. I'm, I'm, that's a good way. Like we tweeted out an announcement of this um, today. Um, you know, the, like I said, there's the, you can sign up for like a, our, we have an email letter, like newsletter, so you get blasts about like, that would be 
all of FIRE's work. So that would be, that would include like our research work, et cetera. Um, that, that would probably be the best ways. Yeah, the, the Twitter account is the Fire Org. That's a fi I figured it was something like that. <laughs> well, it's one word. Yes. Um, well, uh, please thank you first of all for uh, for yeah. keeping for all these wonderful answers. I really appreciate your immersion, and the data, and uh, taking each question so seriously. Um, yeah. I hate to let you go, but I have to let you go. Take care, and uh, right. we'll follow up. All right. Thanks. Thanks again, Sean. But don't leave, friends. Uh, I just want to point out we have a couple of pointers to our next uh, our next sessions. Um, and thank you all for just fantastic questions um, and, and, and really, really great commentary. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, we already have some Twitter comments going back and forth. Just use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, you can tweet at me, of course, Brian Alexander, or at Chindig Events. Uh, and, of course, on, on brianalexander.org. I'd love to see that. Uh, if you'd like to look back into our previous sessions, I mentioned, for example, Hank Reichman, as well as uh, Urbay and Ruth, uh, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive, where you can see examples of all kinds of discussions about that. Uh, looking ahead, we have sessions on reimagining higher ed, campuses and local inequality, what higher ed learned from COVID. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can see more. Uh, and if you have anything you want to share, please just shoot me a note. I'd be glad to share with everybody else. Um, in the meantime, thanks again for a terrific, terrific discussion. Uh, I think this was really, really rich. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well uh, in the Northern Hemisphere as it gets cooler and cooler. I hope you're staying warm and safe. Um, good luck, everybody. Be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>